What's up YouTube, it's Grante and welcome back to the show. Today I'm bringing you another audiobook and this is one of the final chapters in Principles by Ray Dalio, a book which has showed us principles about building oneself and about building an organization. The final chapter, chapter 16, when it comes to building an organization is titled, For Heaven's Sake, Don't Overlook Governance. I guess it's pretty good to have some checks and balances there. Please enjoy chapter 16. This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Principles, Life and Work, written by Ray Dalio in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Chapter 16, and for heaven's sake, don't overlook governance. All that I've said thus far will be useless if you don't have good governance. Governance is the oversight system that removes the people and the processes if they aren't working well. It is the process that checks and balances power to assure that the principles and interests of the community as a whole are always placed above the interest and power of any individual or faction. Because power will rule, power must be put in the hands of capable people in key roles who have the right values, do their jobs well, and will check and balance the power of others. I didn't realize the importance of this sort of governance until after I transitioned out of the CEO role because I was an entrepreneur and company builder, as well as an investment manager, who largely did what I thought was best. While I needed and developed double checks on myself, I created a management committee that I put above me so that I had to report to it. I always had the power of my equity to change things, but I never used it. Some might say that I was a benevolent despot because while I had all the power, the complete voting rights, I exercised my power in an idea meritocratic way, recognizing that the good of the whole was the best for us all. And that I needed to be double-checked. I certainly did not create the sort of governance system appropriate for Bridgewater, given its scale. For example, Bridgewater didn't have a board of directors overseeing the CEOs. There were no internal regulations, no judicial system for people to appeal to, and no enforcement system, because we didn't need them. I, with the help of others, simply created the rules and enforced them, though everyone had the right to appeal and overturn my and others' judgment. Our principles were the equivalent of what the Articles of Confederation had been to the U.S. in its first years, and our policies were like our laws. But I never created a formal way of operating, such as a constitution or a justice system, to enforce them and resolve disputes. As a result, when I stepped out and passed the power to others, confusion about decision rights arose. After conferring with some of the world's greatest experts on governance, we put a new system in place based on these principles. Still, I wanted to make clear that I don't consider myself an expert on governance and can't vouch for the following principles as much as I can vouch for the previous ones, because they are still new as of this writing. 16.1 to be successful, all organizations must have checks and balances. By checks, I mean people who check on other people to make sure they're performing well. And by balances, I mean balances of power. Even the most benevolent leaders are prone to becoming more autocratic, if for no other reason than because managing a lot of people and having limited time to do so requires them to make numerous difficult choices quickly and they sometimes lose patience with arguments and issue commands instead. Most leaders are not so benevolent that they can be trusted to put the organization's interests ahead of their own. A. Even in an idea meritocracy, merit cannot be the only determining factor in assigning responsibility and authority. Appropriate vested interests also need to be taken into consideration. For example, the owners of a company might have vested interests that they are perfectly entitled to that might be at odds with the vested interests of the people in the company who, based on the idea meritocracy, are most believable. That should not lead the owners to simply turn over the keys to those leaders. That conflict has to be worked out. Since the purpose of the idea meritocracy is to produce the best results, 
and the owners have the rights and powers to assess that, of course they will make the determination, though I recommend they choose wisely. B. Make sure that no one is more powerful than the system or so important that they are irreplaceable. For an idea meritocracy, it is especially important that its governance system is more powerful than any individual and that it directs and constrains its leaders rather than the other way around. The Chinese leader Wang Qishan drew my attention to what happened in ancient Rome when Julius Caesar revolted against the government, defeated his fellow general Pompey, seized control of the republic from the senate, and named himself emperor for life. Even after he was assassinated and governance by the Senate was restored, Rome would never be again what it was. The era of civil strife that followed was more damaging than any foreign war. C. Beware of fiefdoms. While it's great for teams and departments to feel a strong bond of shared purpose, loyalty to a boss or department head cannot be allowed to conflict with loyalty to the organization as a whole. Fiefdoms are counterproductive and contrary to the values of an idea meritocracy. D. Make sure that the organization's structure and rules are designed to ensure that its checks and balances system functions well. Every organization has its own way of doing this. This diagram is a sketch of my conceptualization of how this should work for Bridgewater, which is currently an organization of about 1,500 people. The principles it follows, however, are universal. I believe that all organizations need some version of this basic structure. There are 1 to 3 chairmen working with 7 to 15 board members supported by staff, whose purpose is primarily to assess whether 1. the people running the company are capable, and 2. the company is operating in accordance with agreed upon principles and rules. The board has the power to select and replace the CEOs, but doesn't engage in the micromanagement of the firm nor the people running it, though in the event of an emergency, they can drop into a more active role. They can also help the CEOs to the extent they want it. While Bridgewater's idea meritocracy is ideally all-inclusive, there need to be various circles of authority, trust and access to information, and decision-making authority, which are shown in the three circles. E. Make sure reporting lines are clear. While this is important throughout the organization, it is especially important that the reporting lines of the board, those doing the oversight, are independent of the reporting lines of the CEOs, those doing the management, though there should be some cooperation between them. F. Make sure decision rights are clear. Make sure it's clear how much weight each person's vote has so that if a decision must be made when there is still disagreement, there is no doubt how to resolve it. G. Make sure that the people doing the assessing, one, have the time to be fully informed about how the person they are checking on is doing, two, have the ability to make the assessments, and three, are not in a conflict of interest that stands in the way of carrying out oversight effectively. In order to assess well, one has to gain a threshold level of understanding, and that takes time. Some people have the ability and the courage to hold people accountable, while most don't. Having such ability and courage is essential. And the person doing the assessing must not have conflicts of interest, such as being in a subordinate position to the person they are intended to check on, that stand in the way of holding them accountable, including recommending that they should be fired. H. Recognize that decision makers must have access to the information necessary to make decisions and must be trustworthy enough to handle that information safely. That doesn't mean that all people must have access and be trustworthy. It is possible to have subcommittees who have access to sensitive information and make recommendations to the board that are substantiated with enough information to make good judgments, but without disclosing the highly sensitive particulars. 16.2. Remember that in an idea meritocracy, a single CEO is not as good as a great group of leaders. Dependence on one person produces too much key man risk, limits the range of expertise because nobody is good at everything, and fails to establish adequate checks and balances. It also creates a burden because there's generally too much to do. 
That's why we have a co-CEO model at Bridgewater that is essentially a partnership of two or three people who lead the firm. At Bridgewater, the CEOs are overseen by a board largely via the executive chairman or chairmen. In our idea meritocracy, the CEOs are also held accountable by the employees of the company, even though these employees are subordinate to the CEOs. The challenge of having two or three people is for them to dance well together. If they can't do that and coordinate well with the chairman, they have to notify the executive chairman or chairmen so changes can be made. For the same reason, we have more than one CEO overseeing management of the company. We have more than one chief investment officer. There are currently three. 16.3. No governance system of principles, rules, and checks and balances can substitute for a great partnership. All these principles, rules, and checks and balances won't be worth much if you don't have capable people in positions of power who instinctually want to operate for the good of the community based upon the agreed-upon principles. A company's leaders must have wisdom, competent, and the ability to have close, cooperative, and effective working relationships characterized by both thoughtful disagreement and commitment to following through with whatever the idea, meritocratic process, decides. In the chapter closes with work principles, putting it all together. We work with others to get three things. One, leverage to accomplish our chosen missions in bigger and better ways than we could alone. Two, quality relationships that together make for a great community. And three, money that allows us to buy what we need and want for ourselves and others. Since the relative importance of these three things varies by person, it is up to you to determine the quantities and mix you want. The important thing is to realize is that they are mutually supportive. If you want to accomplish your mission, you will be better off having quality relationships with people committed to that mission and financial resources to put behind it. Similarly, if you want to have a great work community, you will need a shared mission and financial resources to support you. And if you want to make the most money possible, you will need clear goals and tight relationships to achieve them. In my life, I have been lucky to have to have much more of all three of these than I could ever have imagined. I have tried to convey the approach that worked for me, an idea meritocracy in which meaningful work and meaningful relationships are the goals and radical truth and radical transparency are the ways of achieving them so that you can decide what, if any of it, is of use to you. Recognizing that I gave you a pile of principles that could be confusing, I want to make sure that the headline I'm trying to get across comes through. It is that of all approaches to decision-making, an idea meritocracy is the best. It's almost too obvious to warrant saying, but I will anyway. Knowing what you can and cannot expect from each person and knowing what to do to make sure the best ideas win out are the best ways to make decisions. Idea meritocratic decision-making is better than traditional autocratic or democratic decision-making in almost all cases. That's not just theory. While there is no such thing as utopia, just like there is no such thing as perfect, there is great, and there isn't much doubt that the results of this idea meritocratic approach have been pretty great for Bridgewater for more than 40 years. Because this approach can work equally well in most organizations, I want to lay it out clearly and in detail. While you needn't follow this idea meritocratic approach exactly as I've done it, the big question is, do you want to work in an idea meritocracy? If so, what is the best way for you to do that? An idea meritocracy requires people to do three things. One, to put their honest thoughts on the table for everyone to see. Two, to have thoughtful disagreements where there are quality back and forths in which people evolve their thinking to come up with the best collective answers possible. And three, abide by idea meritocratic ways of getting past the remaining disagreements, such as believability weighted decision making. While an idea meritocracy doesn't have to operate in any particular way, it does have to by and large follow those three steps. Don't worry about remembering all the particular principles that I gave you in this book. Just go after having an idea meritocracy and figuring out what works for you by encountering your trade-offs and coming up with your principles for handling them. In my case, I wanted meaningful work and meaningful relationships, 
and I believed that being radically truthful and radically transparent were required to get those. Then I went after them and encountered problems that forced me to make choices. By writing down how I made those choices, I was able to flesh out my principles, which led me to shape Bridgewater's idea meritocracy with the people I worked with so that it would work well for us. As you sit out on your own and encounter your own pediment, impediments, you might want to refer back to these principles because chances are that I've encountered many of the same impediments, did my wrestling with how to handle them, and laid out my thinking in principles. And then write down your own. Of course, people's abilities to influence how their group works vary, and I don't know your circumstances. But I do know that if you want to work in an idea meritocratic way, you can find your own way of doing that. Maybe it will be by helping shape your organization from the top. Maybe it will be by choosing the right organization for you. And maybe it will be by simply dealing with the people you work with in an idea meritocratic way. No matter your position, you can always practice being open-minded and assertive at the same time and thinking about your and others' believabilities when deciding what to do. Above all else, my wishes for you are that 1. You can make your work and your passion one and the same. 2. That you can struggle well with others on your common mission to produce the previously mentioned rewards. 3. You can savor both your struggles and your rewards. And 4. You will evolve quickly and contribute to evolution in significant ways.